Hey, so today we're going to talk about natural selection and artificial selection. Uh, so today's title for the lesson is The Best Selection, as you're seeing on the screen there. So let's get into it. Before we actually talk about the definitions and the material and stuff, let's talk about your pets. Wild thing. Most animals we own are known as domestic animals, but were these animals always domestic? Uh, domestic animals have ancestors that were actually wild, and over time, those wild animals were caught and shaped into the pets we have today. So let's talk about, for example, dogs. When we look at dogs, all dogs actually originally came from wolves, right? Like, they're actually the same species. So if you look at, you know, this, whatever this is, this dog, is that a, whatever that is, that actually came from originally a wolf. Uh, it's the same species, but then over time, people have selected traits that they like or want to have in an animal or a pet, like ugliness, and then they keep on selecting the ugliest animal to carry its genes forward until they get the ugliest animal that they possibly can, right? Or maybe uh, the cutest in this, this case right here. Look at that adorable puppy. But basically what happens with the dogs or all of our domestic animals is that the animals that actually have the traits that are wanted for that pet, for that breed, uh, end up getting selected. And then those are the ones that actually then mate again. And that happens over and over and over again uh, until we get these things that look very far away from the original wolf species that it came from. And it is still the same species. So we also call this selective breeding, artificial selection, uh, but plants or animals with desirable traits are bred together to produce offspring with specific traits. Breeding organisms with desirable traits allows humans to manipulate the characteristics of future generations. So that is artificial selection or selective breeding. So why do we call it artificial? Because it's humans doing it, right? We're doing it, we're forcing it, it's not normal that these things would actually meet up in the wild, in nature. Instead, we're saying this is going to mate with this and then we make sure it happens in order for those traits to continue and we prevent things that don't have the traits we want from breeding and continuing on with those traits. So let's take a look uh, in terms of what is the difference between a purebred dog and a mutt. And essentially what it is, is for a purebred dog, what's happened is that it's been bred with um, a dog that has essentially the same traits, that has very, very, very similar genetics. Well, a mutt actually is just, you know, bred with something that's different, that's not genetically as similar. So I'll ask you this, and you kind of have a little bit of a background on this after dealing with uh, species and genetic diversity in that discussion way, way back. But what do you think is typically healthier? Do you think a purebred or a mutt is typically a healthier dog? And the answer is a mutt. Because when we have more genetic diversity, yeah, then we don't have as much of weird genetic recessive diseases or problems that show up. It's kind of like in these bloodlines where you had um, royals, where there's a lot of interbreeding and so on. They end up having big weird genetic issues as a result because all of these recessive trait diseases uh, end up showing up because of the lack of genetic diversity. So the more genetic diversity you have in breeding, actually the more healthy typically the offspring is going to be. So you guys have probably heard that actually often purebreds have big problems, right? So when you take a look at, for example, I think it's Dalmatians often have like these kidney problems kind of early on in their lives. Um, and it's, it's just because they have this like problem with the kidneys uh, that has not been bred out of them because they keep on breeding Dalmatians with Dalmatians to get more Dalmatians. So they can't get rid of the disease, right? Uh, because it's in with the uh, genetic code of the Dalmatians that end up breeding. So we end up with problems. So a mutt is typically a healthier animal. Here's a quick video on artificial selection, cloning, and dogs. So on the farm, there's a lot of artificial selection. And I mean, take a look at, for example, a dairy cow versus a beef cow. Very different cows, but they've been bred specifically for their purpose, right? So a beef cow is for just getting that beef. Uh, 
Well, the dairy cow, of course, is for milk production. So how do you get a dairy cow? Like, how do you artificially select and, and end up with a cow that's so different for a dairy cow as opposed to a beef cow? Well, you take a look at the cow that actually produces the most milk, and that's the one that you end up breeding. And then once you breed that cow and get a cow that produces a lot of milk, maybe even more than its mother, then you take that cow and breed it to get even offspring that produce even more milk. And you keep on going and going and going until you end up with a cow that doesn't look like what you started with, but is really good at milk production. So it all comes down to the you know people basically saying, this is the thing that's going to breed, that's gonna continue on its genetic code to the next generation. So this is done as well with plants and crops. If you take a look at wheat, barley, canola, corn, uh, crops that are grown in Canada, this has happened a huge amount. In fact, oh, what you should see is how corn used to look compared to corn as we know it now. Take a look at that right now. Look at the history of corn and how different it is in comparison to how it started to what it became. Cauliflower is another bizarre one, totally different. And it, it comes from this artificial selection of saying, okay, we want this, so we just keep on breeding the right plants in order to get the traits we want. And typically, it's growing more food, right? When we're talking about a crop, we want better production of food, better pest resistance, that sort of thing. Uh, in other countries, rice, sugarcane, cotton, all these things are things where a lot of artificial selection has happened to get the crop that we now know. All crops are bred to have different qualities like temperature resistance, insect resistance, height, color, sometimes taste, nutrient requirements. Uh, and essentially all you do is you just, again, I keep on saying the same thing, you select the plant that has the characteristic you want and that's what ends up breeding to carry its generation or its traits onto the next generation. Depending upon the location and climate, farmers desire different qualities. So why is it called artificial selection? We already talked about this, but here it is officially. It is called artificial selection because it does not occur naturally. Human involvement makes the breeding process artificial. So humans choose what ends up mating and um, carrying on its offspring. So now let's get into natural selection. Now natural selection is uh, really tied into Charles Darwin and the origin of species. So we actually talked a little bit about this when you watch that video about the Galapagos Islands. Charles Darwin traveled to the Galapagos Islands on the HMS Beagle in 1831 and then completely just became enamored with these islands because he kept on seeing this variation in animals where they're finely tuned for their niche on the different islands. And they had, you know, the same kind of ancestors or close genetic relatives, but essentially they were fine tuned for their food source or their environment. Um, and had these very specialized roles, these very narrow niches where they were adapted to the environment they were in. Uh, one great example that's probably the most famous one is Darwin's finches. When he looked at all the different beaks of these birds and how they were finely tuned uh, to kind of deal with the food source that was on that particular island. So it matching really well uh, adaptations, structural and probably behavioral adaptations as well, the food sources that existed on those islands. So he noticed a variation uh, in animals and plants between the islands and wrote the origin of species by means of natural selection. And that's the basis for essentially the theory of evolution. So natural selection, uh, here are the main points, and this is important for you to know. First of all, point number one, all organisms produce more offspring than could possibly survive. So we, uh, I shouldn't say we, but animals, plants, whatever, whatever we're dealing with as an organism produces more offspring than is going to typically survive. There is incredible variation within species, even more when we have sexual reproduction, but even in asexual reproduction, we have some variation due to things like mutations and stuff. So we have variation. Some variations increase the chances of an organism's survival to reproduce, right? So some things may end up actually being more adapted to uh, survive than other things. And as a result, it is more able to reproduce. So let's talk about, for example, a bird, kind of going onto Darwin's finches. Let's say that a bird needs to crack into a nut as a food source. Then the bird that has a sharp beak, 
that can actually penetrate into that nut, well, that's going to be the one that possibly is more able to survive because it's more able to access food, right? So the sharpest beak bird will be the one that is best at sending its genes on to the next generation because it gets food, it's healthy, it survives, and then it has offspring, and that offspring has sharp beaks. And then from the sharp-beaked offspring, maybe one is even sharper than the original bird, right? Or a few. And those ones are more adapted to survive. And then as a result, we'll get more food and we'll be more able to reproduce. And this continues on and on and on until we have incredibly sharp beak birds. Just one example. We're going to talk about way more examples of this. Over time, variations that are passed on lead to changes and the genetic traits of a species. And then over a ton of time, we can have actually speciation occurring, which we talked about way back when, where we actually have species that become separate because they have a barrier between them, whether it's a physical barrier or whatever, that actually prevents their um, intermingling of genetic code. Okay, so again, four points. All organisms produce more offspring than could possibly survive. There's incredible variation within that offspring. Some variations help it to survive and reproduce. And then over time, those variations that are passed on lead to changes in the genetic traits of those species. So natural selection is the means for evolution. That's the, the mechanism by which it takes place. And natural selection is just survival of the fittest. The thing that is most adapted to survive is going to survive and reproduce and pass on its genetic code. If it's not adapted to survive, it dies, it's done, it doesn't reproduce, and its genes do not go on to the generation. Nature is cruel. So if things don't survive, right, they don't pass on their genes. And things that are the best and most adapted to surviving, okay, that have the best traits for the environment they're in, they have a better chance of passing on their genes. Individuals less well adapted to their environment tend to be eliminated, they die, and as a result, their genetic code dies with them. So whatever adaptations or traits they have will not get passed on. The environment represents the combined biological and physical influences or pressures of change. A great example is the peppered moth. We're gonna do an exam or a whole like thing on this, a worksheet and uh, like an online kind of activity that's really neat. Um, but basically the idea of the peppered moth, to give you a bit of background, um, getting where this was, I think it was in the UK, uh, but there was coal burning power plants that were actually changing the color of bark in an area. And so what happened is these moths, as the bark color changed, were white, uh, but then the white moths were much easier to actually find from prey, like birds going after the moths, and they would eat the white moths that showed up high contrast to the dark wood. Well, some moths ended up having the mutation that actually ended up having darker wings. So those ones were more camouflaged by the bark with the coal uh, influence making the bark lighter. And as a result, those actually ended up surviving more. So over time, this peppered moth ended up getting a darker and darker color because a darker color was more adapted to survive and to pass on its traits to its offspring, right? While the lighter moths wouldn't actually be able to reproduce because they would get killed by a bird or whatever. Then actually over time, uh, coal ended up not being burned as much and then the bark got lighter again and then it actually reversed. So then again, the dark moths actually end up having the high contrast and were easier to find from uh, predators, while the lighter moths actually were more camouflaged. And you can see that effect here, right? This one is a lot easier to see than this one. So lighter moth got eaten. And then as time went on and less coal was burned, this lighter moth is now the one that is going to survive. And this is the one that's going to die because it's not as camouflaged. So then it actually reversed that that particular species ended up getting lighter in color as that changed. With more reproduction of dark moths, the population changed over time to a darker color than the country legislated regulation against coal burning. This led to the trees having a lighter dark bark color, sorry, and thus the lighter color moths became more popular, uh, popular is a weird word, more prevalent again over time. So here's kind of a diagram, and this uses something called a pedigree uh, chart um, that kind of shows like different offspring. So here's the top, there's the, you know, uh, original organism, then it creates this offspring and then creates this offspring and this offspring. And this is something actually reproducing asexually because I only have one organism that's actually making offspring. But essentially what's happening here is saying, well, this dies, right? These die, 
And the darker color is what actually has a trait to be able to pass on over time, traits to the next generation. This is what survives. And as a result, we started with this color, and then over time we got darker and darker and darker color because the lighter colors get killed. Um, so just kind of an analogy. So let's watch the Crash Course video on this. Uh, great explanation of natural selection. Here you go. Okay, so here's a picture of Darwin's finches, and you can see all the different beaks we have here, incredibly different. And the reason why they're different is because of the, the different food sources that these birds actually end up using. So they are very specifically adapted to the food sources that they, uh, that they eat. This is showing oh, antibiotics, and this is actually something we're going to talk about and probably watch a video on this week, uh, which is kind of superbugs and antibiotic resistance. There's a great eye of nigh on this. We'll end up watching that, uh, but really a scary thing, and that is actually seeing um, almost a mix of natural and artificial selection at work uh, because humans are kind of causing a lot of the change based on our wide, wide use of antibiotics. Um, so I don't want to say it's natural selection because it's actually humans that are causing it. We're kind of doing an unintended artificial selection when it comes to uh, super bugs in antibiotic resistant bacteria. This is meant to show two giraffes. Yeah, this one's more adapted to survive. It can eat that. Well, this cannot. So this dies, boom, it's gone. It does not carry on its traits to the offspring. Well, this particular giraffe can. So the more adapted giraffe is going to survive. Here's another picture of two mice. And I think the idea here is try to figure out uh, which one is more adapted to its surroundings. But actually, I don't even like this picture because they both look really not camouflaged at all to what they're on. But this one looks larger, so it must be doing better somehow. Okay, neat. So evolution is that inherited characteristics are passed down from generation to generation uh, that are essentially characteristics that are favorable. And because of natural selection, non-favorable traits are not passed on. A quick review of what I mean by an acquired or a non-inheritable trait. So acquired traits are things that you are not born with. It's not in your genetic code, but it's things that happen to you over your lifetime. Believe it or not, this guy was not born this way. Yeah, uh, he, he's been taking some stuff to get that large, that's for sure. Uh, but essentially, that's an acquired trait. So when he has babies, it's probably not it, but if he did, um, that, that would result in not a incredibly large muscular baby because that is an acquired trait. Same thing, like a skill like juggling, that's an acquired trait, right? Playing the guitar, an acquired trait. Uh, so these are things that you are not born with, born with, it's not inherited, it's instead acquired, and that does not get passed on to offspring. So when we talk about natural selection, we are simply talking about inherited traits, um, tr things that are in your genetic code that can then get passed on to offspring. Okay, so what did you learn? You learned that artificial selection is when humans end up selecting the offspring that ends up mating, and ones that don't have the desired characteristics cannot mate and pass on their genes, but it's humans getting involved. We are selecting which genes get passed on by selecting what mates with what. So how do we use this? We use this to make uh, different like um, breeds of pets, right? We use this for crops and farming and stuff with animals, with uh, yeah, lots of lots of different places where we use it by manipulating what genes get passed on by just selecting what ends up breeding in order to get the traits we want. Natural selection is um, basically where instead nature is kind of deciding in a way. It's just survival of the fittest. So the thing that is most adapted to survive is going to survive and pass on its traits and things that are not well adapted to survive are going to die off. Important to know those four points uh, around natural selection, right, and, and how that works. Uh, and yeah, that's basically it. And understand a little bit of how natural selection um, kind of then feeds into evolution that over time, as natural selection keeps on occurring over and over and over again, well, then we get uh, more and more the difference in traits and we get more and more change. Okay, that's it for today. Have a good one.